Hello everyone. So today we're going to talk about uh, anatomy, variations and anomalies of the coronary arteries. So I've got no disclosures. And the learning objectives we're going to go through, we're going to talk a bit about the normal coronary anatomy. We're going to talk about the range of coronary artery variations. And we're going to talk about some of the basic interpretation of coronary anomalies. So let's start with the coronary anatomy, because this is fundamental to everything we do. So when it comes to the heart, the first thing we have to remember is that it's not placed symmetrically in the chest. It's off to the side, it's at an angle. The classic anatomists, when they describe the anatomy of the heart and the anatomy of the coronary arteries, described it in a, a symmetrical um, view because they thought everything in nature should be symmetrical and beautiful. But everything's actually just slightly squint in the chest, slightly off axis. So when we're talking about left and right, it's almost the left and right side, but sometimes it's not quite referring to sides in that traditional sense. So we've always got to remember overall where the position of the heart is in the body. So we've got two main coronary arteries. We've got the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery, and they both arise from um, the aorta. The left coronary artery is predominantly on the left side, but the right is more anterior and towards the front than necessarily on the right side strictly. So we'll go through these in a little bit more detail. Here we've got the angiographic views, um, which uh, nicely show the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery there. But when we're thinking about um, CT scans, we've got a 3D structure that we can um, see in a little bit more detail. So this video just is an axial view going up and down through the heart. You've got the sternum at the front, the vertebrae you can't see there at the back, and here we've got the heart in the middle. And you'll see the four chambers of the heart, left ventricle, right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle there. When we start up at the top again, you'll see we've got the left coronary artery coming out on the left side, and it splits early on into two branches. So we've got the LED and the circumflex, and then the right coronary artery coming out of the right coronary cusp, more towards the right, but a little bit more anterior than to the right-hand side initially. So let's start with the origins of the coronary arteries or the ostia of the coronary arteries. So you can see we've got the left main stem coming out of the left coronary cusp on the left hand side and the right coronary artery coming out of the right coronary cusp heading sort of more anterior where the sternum is. And we'll start with the left coronary artery. So the left coronary artery it starts with the left main stem, and then it splits into two main branches. The left anterior descending coronary artery, which heads down in the interventricular groove over the anterior aspect of the heart, and the left circumflex artery, which goes more posteriorly. And we'll talk a little bit more about the branches and the segments of these next. So first of all, here we've got the left main stem, And then we've got the first branch, the left anterior descending, and the second branch, the left circumflex. So we've got a bifurcation of the coronary artery here. So the way to remember the two of these is the left anterior descending has anterior in its name, and it's going forward anteriorly on your image there. So the one that's going a little bit anterior, that's the left anterior descending. And then the left circumflex is the one that's going back the way in the atrioventricular group. So the first thing we've got of the LAD is some branches. We've got two lots of branches. We've got diagonal branches and we've got septal branches. So the septal branches kind of do what the name says on the tin. They feed the septum, they go into the septum. They're smaller vessels, they're little branches. The diagonals are often larger branches and they feed the an they pass over the anterior surface of the ventricle and together they all feed the left ventricle. Um, so one of the radiologists that taught me cardiac anatomy many years ago now um, said that the way to remember these if you're struggling is that diagonals go down. 
So what he meant by that was up at the top of the image here, this is the anterior of the image, this is the sternum, this is the bottom of the image, and the patient's lying like that in the CT scanner. So down is towards the posterior at the back of the heart. So if you think of the LED, anything that's on this inferior aspect of it, that's going to be a diagonal. So you can see here we've got a diagonal branch that then bifurcates into two bits. These little tiny ones that go up the way, heading up the way in our image, they're the septal branches. So we've got septal branches and we've got diagonal branches of the LED. And the eagle eyes of you here will have seen the bright white stuff, which is the calcified coronary atheroma. So let's talk about some segments of the LED. So we divide the LED up into segments. Everyone does this in slightly different ways, but there are standard ways of doing this, which are in the SCCD guidelines, which you should read. Uh, the interpretation guidelines, they'll really help you. And there's some lovely diagrams of exactly how to call each coronary segment. For us, we really base it based on where the diagonal vessels are. So we've got the left main stem up at the top, branches into the left circumflex and the LED, and then the diagonal branches help us work out where the different segments begin and end. And we've got three segments. We've got the proximal segment from the left circumflex to the first diagonal. We've got the mid segment from the first diagonal to the second diagonal, and then the distal vessel from the uh, second diagonal down the way. Now, occasionally, the diagonals aren't where you expect them, or you might not see any diagonals at all. There's all sorts of weird variants of anatomy um, that are out there, but this is how you apply it in most cases. Occasionally, you'll not see a second diagonal, and you have to kind of work out just where the mid and distal are based on how big they are. But in most cases, you'll be able to identify these things that will help you work out which segment you're dealing with. And this is important if you want to describe where your atherosclerotic plaque is. So in this case, you can see we've got some calcified plaque and some non-calcified plaque, both in the proximal segment of this left anterior coronary artery. So the circumflex has branches as well, and they're called obtuse marginal branches. And that's because they run along the obtuse margin of the heart. So the anterior margin of the heart is this one up at the front, near the sternum, near the anterior of the body. And the obtuse margin is this one at the back here. So the obtuse marginals go along the obtuse margin of the heart, and they're branches of the left circumflex artery. So here you can see, this is the circumflex here. We've got an early branch of the um, circumflex. So it's the first obtuse marginal is the first obtuse marginal branch and it actually bifurcates into the circumflex that's left behind to go into the in, uh, atrioventricular groove is called the mid-circumflex. And that um, you can see here, we've also got lots of calcified plaque in this patient as well. So that's the circumflex and that's the obtuse marginal. The circumflex can also have some other branches and this um, small one here that's going around the back of the aorta is called the sinoatrial nodal branch. So this supplies the sinoatrial node. It most often arises from the circumflex, but it can arise from the right as well. So occasionally you will see that. Or with anomalies, they can arise from anywhere. So, but most commonly you see it arise from the circumflex branch. If you have other uh, branches further down on the circumflex, they're just uh, counted up first obtuse marginal, second obtuse marginal, third obtuse marginal, until you get to the bottom of the heart, and we'll come on to that in a minute. So circumflex and its segments. Again, we split it into proximal, mid, and distal. So we've got our left main stem, and um, we've got the, that label there should say LED, not LCX, for those of you who are eagle's eyed. Uh, the first part of the circumflex is called the proximal vessel, and that goes to when the first obtuse marginal comes on. The mid-distal circumflex is that bit afterwards, and the actual anatomical cutoff for that can be difficult to identify. It's often where it goes around the bottom of the heart, but we often, in um, terms of segmental analysis, call it the mid-distal circumflex, combining all of that part together. Okay, let's move on to the right coronary artery. 
So again, the right coronary artery, proximal, mid and distal segments, and it has some branches. So we've talked about the right coronary artery ostium coming off the right coronary cusp. And the right coronary artery goes in the atrioventricular groove around the acute margin of the heart anteriorly. So here is a nice view that you'll be able to get of the CT scans. It's often called a C view of the heart. Here we've got the left ventricle, we've got the aortic valve, and then we've got the aorta here. And then this C shape is the right ventricle. So with a bit of fiddling around with your console, you can get this lovely view of the right coronary artery going all the way around. And we can split this into proximal, mid, and distal segments. Now, Unlike the LED, the right coronary artery doesn't have lots of handy branches that are uh, very anatomically consistent. So generally, we take the proximal as the bit that's going along the way, the mid as the bit that's going vertically, and then the distal, the bit that's curving underneath. So the main branch that you'll find in the acute, of the right coronary artery is the acute marginal branch. And that's this little branch, it's often quite small, can be big in some people, and it goes along the acute margin of the heart. So that's the anterior right ventricle that it's going across. There's also sometimes another little branch of the right coronary artery, the conus branch, and this is supplying that top part, the pulmonary conus area, the infantibulum. And that um, off, normally comes off the proximal right coronary artery, and sometimes comes off the aorta itself, and it's a little tiny branch. So now on to the bottom of the heart. So the branches at the bottom of the heart can be supplied by the right or the left coronary circulations. And that's normally the left circumflex. And um, we'll go on to talking about dominance and what defines that a bit later on. The commonest pattern you're going to see is this. So this is the right coronary artery going all the way down round the bottom of the heart and uh, supplying the posterior descending branch. So that's the branch that's going in the interventricular groove right at the bottom of the heart. This is a very important vessel to look at carefully because it's easy to overlook. Um, it's quite small, it's difficult to see it on the axial images, so it's an important vessel because it can be the source of um, myocardial infarctions and I've got a few cases where that was the source and very difficult to see with non-calcified plaque on your um, uh, standard imaging. So dedicated looking at that part is important. Over on the other side, we've got the posterior lateral branch. In this case, this is a branch off the circumflex. It can also be a branch off the right coronary artery as well. So here we've got a combination of our 3D view and our curved planar reformations that show us nicely the LED going down round in the interventricular groove over that apex of the heart. At the back, you've got the circumflex going in the atrioventricular groove. Similarly, the right coronary artery at the front in the atrioventricular groove. And then we've got the branches. So main branches of the right coronary artery is the acute marginal. Branches of the LED are the septals and the diagonals. Diagonals go down. And of the circumflex, the branches are the acute marginal branches. So when we're talking about all of these different segments, uh, it can suddenly become very confusing. But if you think of it in a very structured and very organized way and be very methodical about it, look at each in turn, you'll not miss anything. So again, um, in the uh, SCCD guidelines, there is a lovely diagram that helps you understand where each of these segments are. And according to uh, standard classifications, uh, these have numbers but we usually use the descriptive term proximal right coronary, mid right coronary, distal right coronary, etc. And we normally talk about 15 segments of the coronary arteries. Although people can have many diagonals, people can have many obtuse marginals, it does vary from individual to individual. So another thing to talk about that is important not to forget is the cardiac veins. So the cardiac veins often we don't see um, on our normal CT coronary angiography images. That's because we've timed everything so that it can see the arteries really well, and hopefully we don't see the veins. If we've got slightly later imaging, or the imaging takes longer, a slightly slower scanner, 
we may start to see the coronary veins or we may have actually have done the scan to specifically look at the coronary veins in the case of some EP planning studies. Now the coronary veins cross over the coronary arteries in several places and we've got to be very careful not to misinterpret that as a stenosis. So here we've got an example where, oh, go back the way. So the arrow is pointing to the coronary vein and you can see it's slightly lower attenuation. The coronary artery is the high attenuation similar to our aorta attenuation. If we just looked at that without knowing anything about the coronary veins, we could say, oh no, there's a significant stenosis, critical obstruction in that vessel, but there isn't. That's the coronary vein crossing over and you can track the vein all the way back to, um, to its origin and that helps you understand that that's what it is. So don't be confused by veins if you happen to see them. So the veins all head towards the coronary sinus and this is the coronary sinus at the bottom of the heart here. It's a large um, tubular structure um, that you'll see either in cross section or uh, transverse depending which um, slice part of the heart you're in. I quite often get fellows who are confused and think that all of a sudden there's some amazing coronary anomaly they've found, some weird fistula. No, this is nice normal anatomy. <clears throat> this is what it should look like. We often don't see it, see contrast in it like this. It's all to do with the timing of the scan as to where the contrast is. And if you've got a very fast scanner that's dealing very much with the um, arterial bolus, then this will be dark and you won't see contrast in it. But if you've got a slower scanner or a more longer um, bolus or a, a less good um, uh, coronary circulation, um, heart failure and things like that, you can see contrast in there hanging around. So let's move on to some coronary variations. So the commonest coronary variations is to do with coronary artery dominance. So right dominant coronary circulation, where the right coronary artery feeds the vast majority of the bottom of the heart, is the most common. Left dominant circulation is when the um, vessels come from the circumflex, very rarely the LED. And co-dominant is when they come from both. So in the Scott Hart study, 89% were right dominant, just under 10% were left dominant, and very few were co-dominant. And the interesting thing about this is it does vary depending on the genetics of your population, and also our increasing understanding of um, how detailed information we can get from the CT scans means that we're actually learning more about this. The original um, suggestions of how frequent these were were based on invasive angiography, which is not as good at looking at the small vessels that feed the bottom of the heart. So you're looking for which vessel is supplying your PDA, and most of the time it's going to be right dominant, occasionally left dominant, and very occasionally co-dominant. And that's the commonest variant you're going to find. So variants are slight differences in the anatomical configuration, which have no real pathological significance. This is the next one that I've put in as variants. And some people would debate whether it is a variant or not. And this is myocardial bridging. So myocardial bridging is when the LAD dips into the left my ventricular myocardium. And it can be very shallow, just dipping in very slightly, or it can be deep. It can go right into the left ventricular myocardium and right back out again. It can be short, or it can be over a long segment. The clinical significance of this is a little bit debated, and I've not managed to show that it correlates with anything, but there are studies that suggest it correlates to changes in perfusion and symptoms. So here is that case again, and looking at it side on, you can see this is the LAD here, dipping into the left ventricular myocardium and back out again. So this is shallow myocardial bridging. Um, shallow myocardial bridging, um, a short segment of shallow myocardial bridging in this case. Um, if it's a, a, a long segment of deep myocardial bridging, I um, will be more inclined to highlight it. Uh, this is unlikely to be the cause of anything at all. 
Okay, so another branch for you that's a very common branch, 15% of the population, is the intermediate branch, also called the ramus branch. So the left main stem normally bifurcates, LED and circumflex, but quite often it trifurcates. And the one in the middle, the third extra branch, is called your intermediate branch or your ramus branch. You can also get four branches, you can get five branches. I've seen one case where they had six branches. When it comes to the coronary artery branching pattern, anything is possible. So next we'll move on to coronary anomalies. Now anomalies are things in the coronary arteries that are not um, within the normal range of um, what we expect our population to have. And some of them can also and cause potential problems. So when it comes to anomalies, there's a few different ways you can classify them, but I quite like this one. And this goes through quite nicely all of the different potential anomalies you can get. Now there isn't time in this talk to really talk about every single anomaly that's ever happened, um, but I'm sure if you're interested, you will find lots of different examples of these on the internet. And there's a few good review articles out there in JCCT. So coronary anomalies, um, we can start with an abnormal origin. So is the left main stem there? Is it absent? Are there more than one? Or are the origins higher up in the aorta than they would normally be? High origin doesn't have any particular clinical significance normally, but can be important if the patient's gone for invasive coronary angiography and they're struggling to find the blood vessel and then come to CT to find out if there's an anomalous vessel. And similarly, the surgeons are interested in knowing this as well. Then we've got the anomalies that mean the blood vessel is coming from the wrong place. So normally the left main stem comes from the left coronary cusp and the right coronary artery comes from the right coronary cusp and nothing comes from the non-coronary cusp. But you can have any vessel come from any cusp, including the LED and circumflex individually as well. You can also have the vessels come from, arise from other vessels. So we'll come back to them in a bit more detail. Your coronary arteries can arise from totally different structures. So Alcapa, an anomalous left coronary artery coming from the pulmonary artery is a very important um, abnormality with um, uh, clinical implications. We can have complete absence of a coronary artery or we can have, can have congenital aneurysms of a coronary artery. You can have no coronary arteries at all or an absent one coronary artery or you can have duplications of coronary arteries. And they can also end in abnormal places. So normally the coronary arteries just peter off into little tiny capillaries supplying the whole of the heart, but they can fistulate to other cardiac chambers, to the pulmonary arteries, to the veins, or to the systemic circulation. So you can see that there's really a range of things that we can see. And the beauty of CT with our three-dimensional volumetric data set is we can really drill into what these anomalies are and work out what's going on. Um, and increasingly we're doing this in, uh, we've been doing this in adults for a long time, but increasingly we're able to do this in children as well. And there's um, two really good um, congenital um, papers in JCCT, which go into this and all the other things that you can do. So the first one we'll look at here, high origin of the right coronary artery. So the right coronary cusp is down below and the right coronary artery is up here. So this is coming from the uh, sinotubular junction rather than from the coronary cusp. And um, most of the anomalies that I picked to show you are ones that you're going to see commonly that don't have clinical implications, um, but there are some that do. This is another um, anomaly that I see reasonably often actually. And instead of having a left main stem, both the left circumflex and the LED are coming off the aorta. So this is a dual origin of the circumflex and LED. And again, a very important one if the patient's going for invasive angiography, they can work out exactly where things are in advance and not go hunting for them while they're on the cath lab table. 
And this is the one that always comes up in exams that people always worry about. And this is the vessels arising from other vessels. Most of the time, this doesn't have any clinical implication whatsoever, but sometimes it can be very important, particularly in young people, and it can be the cause of sudden cardiac death. So up at the top, we've got the normal configuration. So we've got a red aorta and the greeny blue pulmonary artery and the uh, right coronary artery and left main stem are coming off in their normal positions. We can have the left coronary artery arising from the right coronary artery and it can pass in front of the aorta or it can go between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. We can have the uh, right coronary artery arising from the left and going around the pulmonary artery to the front of the heart. Similarly, we can have um, the circumflex or the LED or both arising from the right coronary artery and going around the back of the heart. And then all of these are fine, not going to cause a problem, um, potentially cause a problem for trying to find them, but uh, if you always look in a systematic way for each segment of the coronary artery, you'll not miss them. But from a clinical point of view, very little clinical significance. So what we're interested in is the ones that go between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And in particular, we're interested in this one. So this is the left main stem arising from the right coronary artery or even the right coronary cusp and going in between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And the reason we're interested in this is because the differential pressure between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, because they're pumping, that coronary artery can get squashed. And the theory is that the coronary artery gets squashed, we end up with hypoperfusion, secondary arrhythmias and potential sudden cardiac death. And it's really only really important if it's the left coronary artery. We can also see it with the right coronary artery and we're much less worried about this, particularly if the right coronary artery is very small. And in actual fact, the ones that we're really, really worried about is when it's an interarterial course between the aorta and the pulmonary artery and an intramural segment within the aortic wall. We can also get, as we've seen, the uh, retroaortic and the retropulmonic courses and this transeptal course as well. So I'll show you some pictures of these. So this first one, we've got the right coronary, well, this is the left coronary artery here as normal, but the right coronary artery is arising from the left coronary cusp. And it is passing between the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary, sorry, the aortic valve, sorry, the aorta and the pulmonary outflow tract, but it's quite a small right coronary artery and it was quite an old patient. So this didn't have any clinical significance for them. This next one, we've got a video here, I'll just play for you. So this next one, again, it's the right coronary artery um, coming from the left coronary cusp going between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So you can see that on this video here when it starts back up at the top again. Here we go. So the left main stem comes off as normal and almost instantly you've got that um, right coronary artery. This was a younger patient, um, but it's a small vessel. It wasn't of any clinical significance to them either. And here we've got another view of the same thing. Nice 3D view. It's turned around a bit, but this is the right coronary artery swishing all the way around. So the next one we've got here is your left main stem coming from the non-coronary cusp and it's going round the back of the aorta. So this is one cusp here, this is the other cusp here, so this is the non-coronary cusp and this is the left main stem coming from behind here and all the way round. That's quite common to see the left main stem coming from quite far round in the left coronary cusp, but that's normal. It's when it actually comes from the next cusp around that it's considered anomaly. But again, doesn't have any clinical implications for the patient, apart from can be difficult to find in the cath lab. 
This one is the left circumflex coming from the right coronary cusp. So left coronary cusp, non-coronary cusp, right coronary cusp. This is the right coronary artery. That's the little conus branch, but there's another branch here. Now you can get a sinoatrial nodal branch coming from the right side, but this one comes all the way around, all the way around, all the way around, all the way around, and is feeding the circumflex territory. So this is an anomalous circumflex coming from the right coronary cusp. Sometimes you see it coming from the proximal right coronary artery. More often it comes from the coronary cusp. And then this one is the one that we, one of the ones that we worry about. So this is the LED. It's arising um, from the uh, left coronary cusp and it's got this uh, intra arterial course. It's actually going in the wall of the aorta and they've unroofed it in this case. I think the labels are the wrong way around. So uh, this one, you can already see that there's quite a lot going on from the point of view of congenital anomalies. We've got um, our, um, uh, ASD, there's lots of other things going along here. And this is the most common circumstance to see um, lots of weird uh, anomalies. And they've got an enormous pulmonary outflow tract. Um, and this is the left coronary artery coming round the front of that um, uh, pulmonary outflow tract. That's the right coronary artery. This is the left coronary artery. And this is a circumflex branch round at the back. So this LED comes all the way round out to the front. So when it comes to anomalies, anything can start anywhere and anything can go anywhere. So you really need to describe where it starts, where it's passing along and where it ends. And that's a nice structure for always remembering how to describe them. The other thing is if you're very systematic, it helps because if you just look up and down your axial images and look at your curved planar reformations, as many of my fellows do, you're likely to miss the coronary anomaly. And then Michelle comes along and says, what's that little vessel that's going behind the aorta? The other interesting thing is it's very population dependent as to the frequency of these anomalies. So in Scotland, I see very, very few. Um, and it's interesting, I don't know whether that's a genetic thing or whether that's to do with our high prevalence of coronary artery disease, that somehow these have been selected out. But I see dual origin and the occasional um, uh, right coronary artery arising from the wrong place. But the frequency of the malignant coronary arteries and the really interesting, exciting single coronary arteries and all of that, I've seen very, very few. However, if you're practicing in other parts of the world, you may have much higher rates of uh, coronary anomalies. Um, so it's a good idea to work out what's common in your local area and make sure that you can see that and recognize that. So this one is an interesting one. This is a transeptal course of the right coronary artery. So it's arising from the right coronary proximal right coronary artery, just distal to the right coronary cusp there. And then it's going transeptally along here. And you can see it's going across quite a long length and it's quite narrowed. We don't used to worry about these that much, but increasingly we are realizing that they can sometimes be the cause of anomalies, uh, arrhythmias. And um, so this is uh, a case report of a transeptal course that had uh, clinical implications. And then I think this is the last picture. This is coronary arteries ending in the wrong place. So this is a coronary artery fistula. The first hint that something weird is happening is when you look on your axial images and you see all this cluster of abnormal blood vessels up around the pulmonary artery. There's not normally any blood vessels there and there's definitely not normally that many and they don't normally look serpiginous and uh, uh, odd like that. And you can see on the 3D reconstruction, what we've got is actually the coronary arteries are joining in with this abnormal structure here. And this is a coronary artery fistula. The coronary arteries joined the coronary veins and created this abnormal network of veins due to the pressure differential. So this is a nice example of a coronary fistula. So we've talked about um, the anatomy of the normal coronary arteries, the range of coronary artery variations, 
and some basic interpretation of the coronary anomalies. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. <laughs>